Over the issue of rights of conscience, we're facing a problem. And to that problem, a response is being given. But I have trouble understanding the nature of the response. And I hope you might have some good thoughts on why the response coming from us is taking the shape that it is. The problem is the assault on your rights of conscience. The recension of the DHHS ruling extending existing protections for those who wish to abstain from practices like abortion that they consider gravely wrong. We have the same problem in Canada. And the question I want to start with is this. What do you think are the ways in which to respond to that challenge? Now, I know you've thought about this and that you've been doing these things. The question is, what are the most effective ways to stop the attack on conscience? What are the main things that we should be doing? And if we had more time, I'd take a moment and stop to get your answers, but to speed things along, let's just ask a group of people leading the way that question. I suspect you may have heard of Freedom to Care. Let's look quickly at what Freedom to Care recommends. The Freedom to Care site has an action page and the first thing mentioned there is petitioning. Petition the president and your legislators. Second thing to do is educate your legislators. Educate them how. Freedom to Care offers a number of handouts to use to educate your legislators in personal visits, phone calls, and emails on the Resources to Educate My Leaders page. Whether you visit in person or call, you can relay the following information. Just very quickly, what is the information you want to get across? You want to get across key points. First, dropping these rights will be bad for doctors. 95% of physicians in a national poll agreed, I would rather stop practicing medicine altogether than be forced to violate my conscience. Driving faith-based professionals out of medicine would strand hundreds of thousands of patients. Second, it will harm the exclusive patient-to-doctor relationship and get government into personal and sometimes life-and-death decisions. Third, and I think there are two points here, physicians who adhere to the Hippocratic Oath promise not to perform abortion and to guard the sanctity of human life. And abortion-related mandates force these positions to violate the Hippocratic Oath or stay true to it by leaving medicine. And the other point, this is discrimination because of conscience. Fourth, the country supports these rights of conscience. A nationwide survey in April 2009 revealed that 63% support the conscience protection regulation. So those are quotations from uh, these documents. What other information do you want to convey? The second document gives a very useful snapshot of established rights of conscience in healthcare. Federal law on conscience rights in healthcare. The third item clearly documents the public support noted in the key points. Two national polls reveal broad support for conscience rights in healthcare. And the fourth documents a dozen cases of rights abuses conscience-based discrimination in healthcare examples. Now, the last form of action noted is speaking out in the media. Publish your opinion. There is an excellent page on writing letters to the editor that includes a list of top five talking points on the conscience clause. And in these talking points, you have helped to get across the four key points we've gone through. Dropping these rights will be bad for citizens, it will get the government into personal medical decisions. Physicians must be allowed to adhere to the Hippocratic Oath. Americans support these rights of conscience. Plus a fifth point, that this attack is just one more way the Obama administration is the most pro-abortion administration in history. It seems to me, and I want you to tell me if I'm wrong and why, I'm quite open to that because I'm genuinely perplexed. If this is our strategy, 
it seems to me to show an unawareness of or even disinterest in the mind of your opponent and even maybe a lack of confidence on your part. It seems to me that in a battle, you have to care about your opponent. I'm not going to use the word enemy here. You have to ask yourself, what is he going to do? If you don't ask this, if instead you're only looking in the mirror, looking at your own array of resources and picturing all these resources doing their worst, you're in a bubble of unreality and you're not likely going to win. I can't picture any military victor doing that, just looking at his resources and thinking how this is going to do all this damage to the opposition. When they hear these points, will they quit because they see they can't win? You need to ask that. In your activities of petitioning, educating, emailing, faxing, reporting, you're throwing about seven major things at the opposition. Just how do they hear these points? First, when you call the Obama administration the most pro-abortion administration in history, they just say, yes, isn't that wonderful? Second, when you threaten to stop practicing medicine altogether rather than be forced to violate my conscience, quoting that document, some will call your bluff. No, you won't. Not if you love medicine, they will say. And others, and if you've read the challenge, you know this is true, others will say, great, you leave women's medicine to us, that will be perfect. You might worry a few, but this threat won't threaten the opposition all that much. Third, when you say it will get government into personal and sometimes life and death decisions, I think you should see who you're talking to. Are these people who think government shouldn't meddle in personal decisions? When you say that, you're not talking to these people. You're talking to conservatives. Fourth, when you say that abortion-related mandates force physicians to violate the Hippocratic Oath, you know that this is just what these people want. The whole point is to force you to do that, move you on to the up-to-date Hippocratic Oath. Uh, Dr. Patrick could tell you all about the difference between those oaths. What about the fifth point, that a serious majority, over 60%, supports these rights? But who are the people who will be taken aback by that? Not the ones who want to drag the country kicking and screaming into their progressive society, and know they can if they can just get their hands on the levers of power. And it's just those ideologues who are your opponents. And the sixth avenue of assault, documenting cases of rights abuses, cases of discrimination against pro-life doctors, how do you think they will hear those cases you want to report? Your opponents led the charge here by asserting that your claim to rights was abridging the rights of patients. So all you're going to get from those cases is a standoff. You are abusing rights. No, you are abusing rights. The opposition reads your cases of rights abuses as many victories in reproductive justice, as they put it. Now, I'm keeping the seventh, the seventh point back, but before we turn to it, what about those six? Is that a strategy for victory? Is any of this designed to put any serious pressure on what your opponents think? In a couple of the six, loss of doctors and majority support, you're putting a bit of pressure on, but not that much. What you're really doing here is just declaring your colors. Keep government out of our lives. Keep the oath traditional. Or reporting your opponent's victories, a pro-abortion president, reproductive justice, or warning of things that these people really want. You leaving medicine. Progress forced on the country on medicine. Which means you're not fighting them. Not talking to them. You're talking to other people. You don't fight a war by declaring colors, do you? 
Stand up in your red or your blue. Or threatening things your opponent wants. Or reporting his victories. What you're really doing in all of this is trying to call more people like yourselves to the fight. And my question is, calling them to do what? What is the fight? Because this is really recruitment. My question is, when you get the recruits, where's the fight? You have to bring it to these people. What are your weapons, your arguments? Now, what was that seventh point? The final thing that you're throwing at people, back to that education page, is the claim that rights of conscience in healthcare are established. And here's the handout that lays out those laws. Federal law on conscience rights in healthcare. And there are two main emphases in this document that people are pointing out in these laws. First, they want to show how law has recognized religious rights of conscience, protect people from persecution for adhering to religious beliefs. And they want to show that the law has done that expressly in relation to abortion. And I ask you once again, how does the opposition see what is in front of you now? When your opponents receive this information, what are they going to think? Well, I guess you might say, show liberals that we have these rights and we win because these rights can't be taken away. But what does the opposition say to that? They see what you're looking at right here as the problem to be fixed. Do they say, you're right. You Christian and Jewish and Muslim doctors do have these rights, so we can't take them away from you. You know that is not what they're saying. They're saying... That claim to rights is messed up because it's letting you deny services that you are obliged to offer. So these rights need a second look. This stuff you're showing us, we will take that away. They have a case. I don't mean by that they have a decent case, a winning case. I just mean they have something they believe will work. You don't phase them for a second by showing these facts. If you're claiming that rights of conscience in healthcare are established, they are claiming they should be disestablished. That was day one of this fight. And the real question is what are we doing to hurt that claim, to show that there are no grounds for disestablishing rights of conscience in healthcare? Where is the battle? Not what, what is the war over? Right? You see a big difference between where is the battle, not what is the war over, but where are you swinging weapons that hurt their case in their eyes? You have to remember that wars are won by delivering blows to which the opposition says, ouch. You can't win a war otherwise. Blows that the opposition knows are blows. Are you giving these people any food for thought here? It's a strategy of oppositional non-engagement. And I think this is a systemic problem in the Christian world. We stand together in the public square and talk to each other. Who's listening, do you think? Now, you may not agree with what I've said thus far, but if you are somewhat in agreement, maybe you see here, as I do, a Christian failing, by which I mean a gospel failing, a failing of Christ. When Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance, he sits down with those whose minds need changing. And he changes them. He gets them thinking. He gives them something to think about. He tells them something that is unexpectedly true in their eyes that they see is true. You have to engage with your opponent. Get under their skin. And you don't get under an opponent's skin by opposing them. You have to get away from the furrowed brow and the righteous stance. That doesn't give them food for thought. You have to get off the high horse of being in the right, being supported by the past, past laws, the American tradition, being supported by God. That doesn't give them food for thought. You have to convert their minds, change them, move them, from fighting you to quitting this particular fight. 
That's the nature of a battle. You have to change them. You have to prove them wrong in their own eyes, which is what Jesus does again and again and again. They came with rocks. He gets them to put down their rocks and walk away silently. He stops their tongues. He gets them thinking by showing them something they can see. Do you not think you can do that? Do you not think that the truth is on your side? Not just God, but the truth? Now, I hope you found those words repellent to think that somehow the truth could be more than God. But I'm certainly not saying that. I'm saying that if you really take seriously the idea that God supports you, you will see that he supports you by the truth, which he is. You don't know what he has given you, what it means to have God on your side, if you don't think you can win liberals over. Does the opposition want to talk about any of the things that you want to talk about? How abortion is so wrong that special rights attach to it? How religious rights have been established and there's no chipping away at them? No. What did they believe in? There's one key issue in this handout from Freedom to Care that liberals care deeply about. It's not conscience rights in connection with religion or abortion. It's the principle of conscience rights as the rights protecting conscientious objectors in wartime say. And here's what I would ask our opponents. Don't you believe in conscience rights? And here's one of my questions to you. Why don't you think that is a good question? People don't seem to think it is because it's not one of the talking points. But I think it is the talking point, the Achilles heel. The opposition believes in rights of conscience, and that's all you need to win this battle. But you don't seem to be using this knowledge, though it is your most powerful weapon. When you start seriously to talk about rights of conscience per se, not religious rights, not rights specifically over abortion, you will find yourself wielding a weapon that can knock the opposition back in their tracks because you're talking about what they believe. What do you think these people think, these people you're looking at here, think about the Vietnam War, even ones who weren't born then? If we look back to 1970, we can read in this article from Life magazine, just to show you that what I'm going to say is common knowledge, no fine point of law. It's an article about a young man who asks to be declared a conscientious objector. I quote, The question of the draft, who should serve and in what capacity, and what are the rights of conscientious objectors, has been heatedly debated since the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940 was passed. Until several years ago, would-be conscientious objectors were required to establish a link between themselves and some peace religion, such as the Society of Friends, Quaker. Then, in 1965, the Supreme Court ruled that a conscientious objector need not believe in the existence of a supreme being. This ruling was expanded last month when the Supreme Court held that any individual may object to military service on ethical and moral grounds if such convictions are deeply felt. So here at this draft hearing in Michigan, a 19-year-old had to put forward private reasons to substantiate his claim. Well, the reasons weren't private. They had to do with a universally intelligible reticence about killing another human being. People who call what pro-life physicians are doing conscientious objection gone awry are quite evidently not against conscientious objection. They are against conscientious objection gone awry. Presumably, they accept conscientious objection to military service in time of war, since that is the most standard application of that concept. Well, just ask, how do you lay claim to that right? What do you have to do to be protected by that right? How is it supported? On what basis is it granted? It is granted by looking at the nature of the issue and the status of the argument the objector can make 
in defense of non-involvement, not the source of his hesitancy. Just where does the conscientious objector get his compunctions from? Religion? A voice in his head? We don't ask. It doesn't matter. It is the nature and cogency of the reservation and the genuineness with which it is held that count. Most people are agreed that killing an aggressor in war is not wrong. But still, the conscientious objector is understood to have a right of conscience to which he can appeal to avoid doing such killing. Why? There's an answer to that question. Why? You just can't force a person to kill against his conscience. What must kick in to grant people the right to refuse wartime service is the fact that what they're asked to do is to kill their fellow man or play a part in such killing. If it's wrong for you to do it, then it's wrong to play a part in getting someone else to do it in your place. And so, objectors were required, quote, in view of military service to complete two years of civilian duty. The degree or quality of wrong is plainly an issue here. Notice something else. We don't reach the conclusion that people possess a right to refuse military service by first resolving the debate that stands between the defender of force and the pacifist. Anyone who has listened to an articulate pacifist can agree that the case for pacifism has a lot going for it. But however sound his argument is, we mostly rate it inferior to the case for forceful defense. The pacifist has not demonstrated the wrongness of killing in war, nor has he won our respect by the matching force of his argument, since his argument doesn't sway us. It's not equal to ours, because we don't accept it. Yet we recognize the right of the conscientious objector to abstain from killing, for three reasons. It matters that there is a case for pacifism, that the pacifist's argument is not, I just don't want to, or a voice in my head says no. He can make a respectable case. If it were just individual morality, a kind of personal reluctance with no articulable support, the kind of thing that people oddly suppose is driving you doctors, I don't believe we would recognize the pacifist's objection. But morality is never individual, a point that seems lost on these critics of moral objection. So you can show that your opponents are hazy on the nature of both conscience rights and morality, the two things that are most central to the debate, by the way. Moral rather than personal objection typically brings, to quote Jean Bethke Elstein, values arrived at over centuries of accumulated learning and teaching and debate to the public square for public consideration in the name of the common good. Nothing individual about that. That there is a respectable case to be made for pacifism, which is not mere personal reluctance, is part of it. The second part is the gravity of the deed at issue, causing people to die. We grant conscience rights to the pacifist because we understand that it might injure a person deeply to require him to kill a fellow human being when he recoils from it. There are certain things related to universal prohibitions we all understand, the killing of people, that it is wrong to make a person do against his will. Dr. Curtis Tart, whose guidelines governed all the U.S. hearings on conscientious objection, had said that, quote, the primary test that must be used in determining who has a legitimate claim to these rights is the test of sincerity. The belief upon which conscientious objection is based must be the primary controlling force in the man's life. The 1-0 classification is given to absolute conscientious objectors who refuse to go into the armed services under any condition, provided they can persuade draft boards of the legitimacy of their convictions. End quote. You didn't get this designation for the asking. The article from Life noted that the designation, quote, is difficult to obtain. Only 18,065 are now on the books. It's not complicated 
Those are the things that the standard case of conscience rights rest on. Religion, which may or may not play a role, was not mentioned. And notice how little you've heard about these things in the current debate. Though they all work for you. Are liberals against conscience rights? Hardly. The challenge to conscience rights over abortion is not really a challenge to conscience rights at all because it's coming from people who believe in conscience rights. Now just let that sink in. Something else is going on. In Canada, the white knight of the pro-choice movement is Dr. Henry Morgenthaler. In 2008, Dr. Morgenthaler, once called the doctor who couldn't turn away, was granted the Order of Canada, the highest honor in the land. Why? Not for the embryos he has destroyed since the 1960s. As pro-choice people constantly remind us, no sane person sees the abortion itself as a good but rather for defending his belief that a pregnant woman should have the right to a safe abortion. He was honored not for the abortions he performed, but for stalwart adherence to his conscience, which left him firmly convinced, he said, I quote him, of the moral rightness of my course of action. Even when the police were at the door, when he openly broke the law, he was arrested. The American Humanist Association named him the 1975 Humanist of the Year. American defenders of choice have their own heroes, too. Other people did the same thing in the United States. These people are honored as heroes by liberals for being morally driven, conscientious objectors at a time when it had not been demonstrated that prohibiting abortion was wrong at a time when they were out of step with public sentiment, and at a time when the law stood against them, these things constituting the conditions for conscientious objection. To be an objector, there has to be a norm to which you object, a generally accepted position on what is right to which you object. Yet, though all those things stood against these people, their conscience-driven activity is still given special recognition. Everyone believes in rights of conscience. And if rights of conscience are not based on religious or moral beliefs, then there are none. Disconnect those beliefs and goodbye rights of conscience. Now, apply the standard understanding of rights of conscience to the current situation. And let's hear the opposition's description of that situation. Here's the essence of the claim that started this debate. Religious doctors are letting their own particular stand on morals block the recourse of their patients to legal medical procedures that are within the standard of care. Religious doctors are letting their own particular stand on morals block the recourse of their patients to legal medical procedures that are within the standard of care. Is that what you're doing? Well, it's hardly a particular stand in the sense of something idiosyncratic indefensible by public reason, you are taking a moral stand, talking about human rights, rights not perched on any religious stance, but held by all human beings just because they're human. But that apart, is that what you're doing? It is exactly what you're doing. It's exactly accurate. So this might be a case covered by conscience rights. Well, let's hear your case. If religious doctors are letting their stand on morals block service that a lot of people would like them to deliver, there's nothing in that that offends the principle of conscience rights because if conscience rights applied here, that is exactly what they would justify. We can say the very same thing about conscientious objectors in wartime. These are people who are letting their own stand on morals absolve them of a responsibility. We are all agreed is essential to public welfare. The whole point of the principle of conscientious objection is to say that these things that look very bad to many of us are in fact okay. The whole point of the principle is to say that though people, the majority, 
The general public, the people in charge, do not agree with the objector's stance. The objector has a right. But he has to make a case. So give us your case. Convince us. When this debate is framed to focus on the source of claims of conscience, on the religious basis, the pivotal fact that conscience rights hinge on arguments is totally ignored. Some of the people working against you are implying, this is their implication, that rights of conscience are spoiled by religion. Dr. Julie Cantor in the New England Journal of Medicine warns that, quote, if the overriding consideration were individual conscience, then tolerating a surgeon who holds moral objections to transfusions might well be permitted. Right, a Jehovah's Witness surgeon. Because once you grant individuals a virtual religious veto, then you have, she says, a rule that knows no bounds. You wind up in a state of conscience creep in which all behavior becomes acceptable. Well, that's nonsense. That scenario has nothing at all to do with conscience rights because you don't get such rights by asking for them or playing the religion card or pointing to the source of your reservations. You would have to show that there is some reasonable doubt about the rightness of transfusing patients in the OR and a Jehovah's Witness surgical nurse cannot show it has no case, cannot inspire Americans with any reservation whatsoever about transfusions. If you don't call people on how conscience rights work, they can create doubts like this in the mind of the public. So turn now to abortion and apply the standard considerations governing the granting of conscience rights. To decide whether a person can claim such rights to abstain from abortion, you weigh the cogency of the argument that wrong is done and the gravity of the wrong at issue and the sincerity with which these beliefs are held. That the creature in the womb whose life is taken is an innocent human being is the most straightforward and obvious position that this entire debate affords. That it is reasonable to think that a fetus might be human that's all you need to show, is something that no intelligent person denies. Roe versus Wade didn't deny it. President Obama doesn't deny it. He acknowledges that it is reasonable to think that. Well, that creature that might be human is killed in the procedure. The case for claiming that wrong is done in the eyes of the doctor, the nurse, is pretty hard to ignore. Is it a grave wrong? It's death. That the death of the creature in the womb is what every abortion intends is irrefutable. So the case that your involvement in abortion, that someone who is against the killing of the innocent is required to participate in just that killing, is fully made. What about sincerity? In the minds of your opponents, there just isn't any doubt at all that for you, for you Christians, Christianity is, quote, the primary controlling force in your lives. That's your problem, they say. During the Vietnam War, there was a question about convictions of convenience. When did you go pacifist? The day your draft notice arrived? But sincerity, even then, could be tested, even then the status could still be granted. You have no problem on that score. There's no overwhelming advantage for you if you refuse what your profession is pressuring you to do. Bucking the system only brings you grief. Those instances of discrimination you're reporting. The case is made. The case for unpunished abstention from abortion services is fully made by the standard considerations of rights of conscience. We grant conscience rights to the pacifist because we understand that it might injure a person deeply to require him to kill a fellow human being when he recoils from it. Abortion is the same situation. 
The fact that this liberal or that does not believe that any person is killed has no bearing on the issue. He is not the one asking not to participate. You are. That a non-pacifist does not believe that any wrong is done by killing the enemy has no bearing on the issue. He isn't the one asking not to participate. The pacifist is. The fact that a war is on when people need to be killed, as people tell the pacifist, has no bearing on the issue. The fact that you work in medicine where people need to be served has no bearing on the issue. You do believe that someone is killed. And to pressure you to participate in that killing against your will, to pressure you even to count this proper to medicine, is wrong. Because you can make quite as good a case as the pacifist that a human being is willfully killed by abortions. Why don't we just show people that when they simply apply the standard conception of conscience rights, which does not rest on religion, the case for unpunished abstention from abortion services is fully made. Teach people how to think about conscience rights. You will not be making anything up. This brings out something that it's very important that we see and that we're not seeing when we press the usual talking points. What is driving the challenge to conscience is not a position on conscience rights at all. No one is against rights of conscience. Have you heard anyone in this debate standing up against rights of conscience? Nor are they against religion. They may be personally, but that's not what they're trying to put a stop to. They know they'll never get anywhere on that point. What people have really objected to is abstention from abortion. Their reason for mounting this challenge, their belief that every healthcare worker is obliged to provide abortion-related services, cannot threaten the principle or the grounds of conscientious objection since it lays not a finger on them. These people seem led by their own personal conviction that abortion is right to ignore the fact that you have a straightforward claim to conscience rights. But what is odd is that you don't see it much better than they do because your talking points do not explain how they're granted and what conscience rights do. In a free society, conscience rights recognize the legitimacy of certain convictions that depart from the convictions of the public. So the first point is how you get them, and the second is what they do. There's no need to say anything about religion. And if you do, you wind up shouldering this burden alone. You are absolving your secular colleagues of the need to acknowledge, to say yes to, what you see on the screen here. Everywhere that there are people working to erode your rights in medicine, what is driving them is no criticism whatever of rights of conscience. What is driving them has to do with abortion. But these people do not want to argue about abortion. Arguing about religion is working much better for them. What these people are against is the shrinking of abortion services that they believe should be accessible to everyone. But they do not want to tackle the arguments needed to show that their so-called reproductive justice is truly just. They don't want to prove that no injustice is done to the destroyed fetus. They don't want to explain why we should honor the individual beliefs of every American patient. In my personal philosophy, the patient says, the creature in my womb is not human, so I need a health procedure to remove it. They don't want to explain why we should honor the individual beliefs of every American patient at the same time as we ignore the beliefs of every individual Christian Jewish, Muslim, physician, technician, med student. They don't want to make the case that abortion is truly what women need or that unlimited access to abortion is good for society. Instead, they would rather hint darkly at future punitive action for non-referral and sit back as Christians rush to defend the conscience rights for the religious. They don't need to say a word in this debate. They can just relax and enjoy the general public misapprehension that moral rights of conscience or rights of conscience in medicine are wild new ideas cooked up by religious zealots. And what they need you to do is to oblige them to play their game. They're pushing the buttons of the religious so as to get the religious to make this issue an issue of religion when it isn't. It's important for you to see 
that the challenge to conscience rights over religious and moral compunctions is really a feint, a fencing term for a feigned attack designed to put the defender into a posture of vulnerability. In the American Civil War, when the Confederate Army managed to fight the Union Army by getting the Union soldiers to come to it, to walk down the road with Confederate soldiers coming through the woods, the result was always a stunning Confederate victory. I mean, picture it. <clears throat> Confederate soldiers in the woods and the Union Army just walking down the road. As you know, the victor is often the one who picks the battlefield. The battlefield over conscience rights has been chosen for us, and it is religion. Arguing for religion as a basis for medicine is well worth doing. But when people's careers are on the line and innocent lives hang in the balance, handier tools of rescue would be nice to have. Well, they're here. They're right here in front of you. The issue is not religion. Are these rights being taken from the religious? Do you have to be religious to be against abortion? Your opponents just rub their hands in glee at the prospect of Christians countercharging professional conduct regulations with cries of religious persecution. Why? because that response frees the secular world to walk away from the issue. Unless you correct the misunderstanding about the nature of conscience rights, correct it in the minds of the public, you will lose the serious public support that should be yours, entirely yours. Let me offer you a cautionary tale from recent Canadian history. I'm saying that your opponents have launched a move to guarantee abortion by luring physicians and their supporters to argue about religion in the eyes of the public. In Canada, we have already lost that battle once, and we will always lose it every time we choose to defend a public issue such as this as a challenge to religion. In 2003, court decisions in Canadian provinces began to legalize same-sex marriage, and the debate began. Should this be done? The debate about same-sex marriage is not a debate about religion. It is a debate about the meaning of marriage and the numerous things linked with marriage. The redefinition of marriage, which the idea of same-sex marriage necessitates, trails many problems. Problems that people in Canada needed to see, and really, I believed, could see. That God is against it is not one of them. People have to get God before they can see that. And so at Augustine College, we drafted a pamphlet laying out 22 of these really quite accessible reasons. But the opponents to same-sex marriage did not take that line. They emphasized religion quite a lot, so much so that the debate came to be seen as Christians wanting everyone to accept their Christian understanding of marriage versus people who believe in equal rights for all. A disaster. Bill C-38, a civil marriage act redefining marriage, was introduced under a liberal prime minister in February 2005, passed by the House of Commons in June, by the Senate in July, and received royal assent the next day. Then the government changed, and in December 2006, a conservative prime minister advanced a motion to look at the matter again, Members of Parliament were free to vote, free to vote their conscience. What was the result? It was defeated, 175 to 123, and Canada remained the fourth country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage. Why do the Conservatives not want to support it? The debate in their minds had already been held. If you march down the road to meet your challengers, and manage to color for them the principle of conscientious objection as a principle of religion in the eyes of the public, then you can watch the support that is rightfully yours just crumble away. Do not be manipulated into distorting the notion of rights of conscience so that it can be trashed to secure abortion services. I mean, just think of that. The issue here is not religion, but ultimately it's not abortion either. There is sadly a lot more at stake in this. 
If the fog that is now sustaining the debate over rights of conscience in healthcare is not dispelled, far more trouble is coming. Soon you'll be talking, as we are in Canada now, about euthanasia. We now have another bill on the table. If euthanasia arrives as needed relief from soaring health costs, and if you have let the support for conscience rights be injured by a disastrous framing of the debate, then how will the euthanasia debate go when you want to have that? As you claim rights of conscience to avoid killing people, this time people whom no one doubts are truly people, the heads of your profession may have decided, like our parliament did, we've already had this debate over abortion and conscience lost. We had the same-sex marriage debate once in Canada and we could not have it again. So you had better really have the debate about conscience now, properly, and in earnest. The war you are fighting is a war of education. I say again, the rights challenge is not a challenge either to conscience rights or to religion. It is a gross confusion about what rights of conscience are. You have to educate people about the principle of rights of conscience. You may not need to do more. Explain how rights of conscience are accorded and what they do. Show people that when they apply the standard conception of conscience rights, the case for unpunished abstention from abortion services is fully made. But you will have to figure out how to do that by yourselves. Don't count on help from the media entrusted with public education. With a California physician last year, I co-authored an article uh, before I left on Sunday last year in April, I think Jean gave me an article from the New England Journal of Medicine, which I read in Knoxville Airport, st stunning the article that I showed you by Dr. Julie Cantor, and was just inspired by all the bad thinking that I'm talking about right now to write an article. And this California doctor, Andre van Mol, helped me uh, get it down into a readable size, an article making these and related points in a clear and interesting way. We had two versions, 2,000 word version and uh, 800 words, which is just a little too bare bones at 800 words. In a debate like this, you really need time to explain. We think it's a good article. You can judge this for yourselves. I had a few copies here and, and uh, Jean has offered to put it on the website if you want to download it later. We thought it was a good article. We thought that newspapers or magazines would be interested in an informative piece on a topical issue. It's been rejected about 15 times, remains unpublished. None of these purveyors of ideas is interested. The atmosphere is already very poisoned. The media are in the fog with your administrators, and they will not be made into a religious pulpit which is what many people take the defense of conscience rights to be, or they just want to shut us off because we're making dangerous sense. To me, this seems evidence that the doors of mainstream media are closed, even to quietly and helpfully explanatory efforts like ours. So it looks like you'll have to do your job of educating head to head. It's not a catastrophe that we can't use the media. That's how civilization worked for thousands of years. The argument will have to be made person to person, colleague to colleague. That job falls to those in the medical community who see what there is to discuss. Those who see nothing to discuss have folded their hands already. Seems to me that it falls to you. Everyone in the medical profession needs someone to explain to them ever so calmly just how rights of conscience are accorded. You will have to show them. Some of your co-workers may have retreated to the sidelines on this debate because they are not religious and abortion is not an issue for them. So don't talk to them about either. Instead, ask them, are they against conscience rights per se? Is there any place, do they think, for rights of conscience in medicine? Put it to them this way. Imagine that euthanizing became standard health care for Alzheimer's sufferers. Baroness Warnock, reputed to be Britain's leading moral philosopher, argued last year that Granny has a duty to die 
to stop wasting the resources of the National Health Service. Ask them if they would opt out of that health service, claiming rights of conscience to do so. Rights, protecting them from the professional obligation to kill. You will find them coming over to your side on this issue, if your side is about the issue, the principle of rights of conscience. People in authority with a pro-choice stance have pressured your profession to comply with their views, unaware that what they are doing runs against the bulwark of the standard notion of conscience rights, which shelters people in a free society from just such pressuring. Muscling and threatening happen. After all, that's why that bulwark of rights came to exist. But it does exist. Management structures in healthcare or in media can foist on the populace, top down, the hasty opinions of overconfident individuals, constrain the debate to their preferred terms, blind us to the issues, and tie us up in sideshows. True enough, an unwitting populace can be mastered that way. But this debate can be settled. It's far easier, far safer, to win this battle now than to practice medicine later in a deranged system that has rendered moral objection null.